Thank you for such a great introduction. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, I really hope that I can live up uh, to your expectations. Thank you, Dr. Knapp. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Green, for the awesome invitation and the opportunity to be here. I want to say thank you to my family and friends. I feel like I have an entire section right here. Uh, thank you for just coming out on this snowy uh, January Monday to come and support me. I really, really appreciate it. It's been amazing being on campus. It was amazing sort of speaking to you in chapel this morning, uh, having lunch with some of the students and actually eating. And Phelps, Phelps is actually unrecognizable to me. Uh, it underwent a major transformation, and the food was actually good. Uh, so that was, that was a big deal. Uh, it's been almost 10 years since I first stepped foot on this campus. But it feels just like yesterday. Uh, my buddy Julian and I, we were watching some uh, college football in Scott Hall. And as you can see here, uh, cleanliness was clearly not a priority for us uh, when we were coming up here at Hope College. We like to have a good time. This is my buddy Ethan and Glenn. And we're at the uh, thrift store formal that's put on by the girls in Gilmore. Uh, we were doing our laundry uh, frequently in Collin Hall. Some of you may uh, recognize this here. You know, every now and then we studied. You know, studying obviously is important. Uh, we were pre-meds, and so, you know, we needed to get accepted into medical school, which is something that all of us did, which is a major accomplishment. Uh, we supported the Duke crew, whether they were here in Holland or uh, away at Calvin. I think this is at Calvin's old gym. And uh, this is me posing with our crew. This is, uh, these are the fellas of Stryker Cottage. Uh, this is actually, we posed for our, I think this was our 2008 Christmas card that we sent to our families. We thought we, thought we were pretty cool. And uh, Hope is also where I began dating my wife. She's actually a Grand Valley, uh, Grand Valley State University alum, but we spent a lot of time on, our, on Hope's campus here, and she is here to support me today, and for that I'm forever grateful. All right, so, you know, as you can see, you know, I really developed my foundation here at Hope. This is where I really grew. It was a launching pad for my success. So I don't know if you can imagine the joy I have on the inside of me as I stand here before you to give the Martin Luther King Jr. keynote address. It's such an honor to be here not only as an alumni, but as the youngest person to ever deliver the Dr. King keynote address here in Dimnit Chapel. I'm 27 years old, and I tell you this because Dr. King was 27 years old when the Montgomery bus boycott catapulted him onto the national scene. Now, it's funny how history repeats itself, and I'm not talking about how the, the fashionable jogger pants that my wife got me for Christmas kind of look like MC Hammer pants, or even the uh, resurgence of the Polaroid camera. No, I'm talking about how Nearly 50 years after Dr. King's death, we're still dealing with racism in America today. In 2016, when I studied late at night at the University of Rochester's Medical Center Library, my heart feels like it's beating outside of my chest late at night when campus security comes and does their nightly rounds because my mind is emblazoned with the memory of Tamir Rice and Walter Scott. And I think that's unacceptable. I really, really do. I really think it is time for a fresh, new perspective. We need to ask God to sort of search our hearts and to know our minds so that we can really understand sort of who we are and where we're coming from so we don't repeat the same cycles of history. Time is too precious and life is too short to repeat the same cycles of history. Now, my wife will tell you that I'm obsessed with time. I'm actually obsessed with both time and sports. And as a medical student, you know, I'm constantly planning out chunks of my life. I'm planning for the next exam. I'm planning for my career. I'm planning for residency. It's, it's an important part of being a medical student. And to shake things up so it doesn't get monotonous, lately I've actually sort of dedicated years of my life to uh, either a notable sports figure or a certain theme. So 23 was my Kobe year, or was my Jordan year, forgive me. And uh, 24 was my Kobe year and so on. Well, I guess uh, you can say that 27 is my king year. 
And when I think about Dr. King, this is him at 27 in Montgomery, Alabama. When I think about Dr. King at 27 years old, one question comes to mind. What drives a man to, at 27, leave an idyllic Boston University campus to turn down prestigious job offers at all of the top academic institutions in our nation, to leave a life of comfort and prestige that he had ahead of him, to drop all of that and move to Montgomery, Alabama. Just think about that for a sec. Montgomery, Alabama. We're not talking about just any city in the United States. We're talking about a citadel of despair for racial relations in the South. So not only did he sort of turn down sort of all these prestigious job offers, but he put his life and his family's life in the line of danger to transform Montgomery, Alabama into a tower of hope. Now we know from Hebrews 11 and 1 that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And what Dr. King did in Alabama, what he did in Montgomery, Alabama, was to ignite a substance so flammable that our nation could no longer ignore the flames. So, as I reflect on my King year, I'm called to examine my life and how it stacks up to Dr. King's. Do I, David Allen Paul, have inside of me the strength and courage of Dr. King? I'm going to be downright honest with you. The answer is no. I don't think any of us do. If, if, if any of us do, we would, we would already be the next Dr. King. But the bigger question is, is God big enough to grant me even a small portion of Dr. King's strength and courage? And am I willing to surrender myself and accept his call on my life? And the answer to that question is yes. So tonight as we reflect on his life and legacy, I'm really going to challenge you to join me on my King year 2016. Now, just for a show of, show of hands in the crowd, how many of you have actually written down on a piece of paper, not just thought up in your mind, but actually written down, line by line, your New Year's resolutions for 2016? Actually written down. Well, that is like not very many people at all. <laughs> wow. No wonder why we're repeating the same cycles of history. So, but, but for those of you who didn't raise your hands, I will let you know that we, we, you are actually in the right place at the right time, okay? Because this talk is chalk full of New Year's resolutions that you can use in 2016 to change the narrative. So if you have pen and paper handy, if you're taking notes, this is an awesome opportunity for you to get those materials ready because I'm going to present to you a three-point challenge, all right? And this is going to be a difficult challenge for you, and you're going to have to fill in some of the blanks. And if it's not difficult, if you're not struggling with it, you're not, you're not doing it right. So the first part of the challenge is to identify who you are. How do you identify yourself as a human being on this earth? Number two, I'm going to ask you to develop some substance. Is your cup full or is it empty? Because this is not going to be a glass half full, half empty kind of talk. The last thing, number three, I'm really going to challenge you to build on number one and two so that you can light up the Tower of Hope, to let your light so shine that men may see your good works. And I, I tell you that this is, this is going to be a tough challenge, and there, there are some blanks that you're going to have to fill in here. And I'm going to start with a little story of my time here at Hope. Now, 
when I was a student here, I really identified myself by my mustache. Now, if you, if you go back and you think about all those pictures that I, I showed to you beforehand, the one constant thing in all of those pictures was my mustache. Now, I know most of you are sitting there, you're snickering, I hear some of you, you're looking side to side, you're wondering, what in the world does this mustache have to do with Martin Luther King Jr. Day? Well, we're going to get there, trust me, trust me. I had been growing my mustache for like 18, 19 years, I had never shaved it. It was definitely a struggle, and my buddies, you saw them earlier, Julian and Ethan, they had beards like lumberjacks, and they didn't really understand. Maybe there's a guy out there who's a student here at Hope College, and you've been growing that mustache for a long time, and you're trying to keep it nice and trim and looking good. Like, you understand that the struggle is real. Well, Julian and Ethan realized that um, I was so wrapped up in, in this identity that they thought it was funny that in the same semester that I was running for Hope College president in which I really thought that my appearance like really meant something, they decided that we were gonna go on, to a, on an impromptu trip to Indiana to spend Easter weekend with Ethan's family. And on our way down there, they threatened to shave my beard off, or my mustache. It wasn't quite a beard, it didn't connect on the sides. And I will tell you, it put the fear of God in me. <laughs> Needless to say, I slept with one eye open. And in the middle of the night, it was probably about 3 a.m., and you may have saw the picture of Julian earlier. He's a Ghanaian fellow. He's quite dark-skinned. And I, and I look up, I hear a rustling, and all of a sudden, there's these two pearly white eyeballs floating towards me in the darkness. <laughs> he, he prounces on me and, and holds me in a tight grip. And then here comes Ethan. And Ethan's walking in with what looks like a very dirty razor and some shaving cream. In all of my might, I break free of Julian's grip. I even, I think, shove him into the wall. I say a lot of nasty things that, that I really, really should not repeat and that I'm not proud of. And I actually even threw out a racial epithet, and I made sure that they knew who David Paul was. Now, that night I saved my mustache, but at what cost? I was vulnerable. I had an identity crisis. I was willing to sacrifice my relationship with Julian and Ethan to save my identity as a mustached man which if you really think about it, is just very stupid. God is calling us to question our identity. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you so wrapped up in your preconceived notions of race and identity, your lives of comfort and freedom, Whatever you think you may identify yourself with, are you so caught up and wrapped up in that thing that you are willing to sacrifice your relationship with Christ over an identity that we would probably laugh about? I will tell you that it is important that we are vulnerable with each other. It is important that we are vulnerable with God. In that moment, I was extremely vulnerable and I'm not proud of the way I handled myself. And I will tell you something I found out over time. Racism is nothing more than unchecked vulnerability. Just, just ponder that for a moment. How comfortable are you being vulnerable? Are you with being vulnerable? How do you identify yourself? Is your identity rooted in Christ? Or is it rooted in something that just makes no sense at all? When we are able to surrender our identities to Christ, we're able to see a larger picture. We're able to engage in community. We're able to represent Christ well. 
Now, I'll tell you an example of how this works. You know, we see it in the life of Dr. King, but even in modern day society, we see this with the University of Missouri football players. They realized that their identities were larger than football. They risked their season to bring about change and social justice on their campus. They realize that football is just a game. What matters is how we treat people. What matters is how we go on about our daily lives and live in a community of harmony. You know, every time I watch the movie 42, I'm reminded of what it means to lose your identity for a greater good. You know, I don't know if anybody has seen 42, but this is even before Martin Luther King Jr. was on the scene. We see Branch Rickey, who's the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, surrender himself to Christ, to surrender himself to God in order to integrate Major League Baseball. And I'm just going to pause for a minute to show you a clip of what this looks like and how difficult it can be. Branch, it's Herb. Hello, Herb. What can I do for you? Branch, how long have we known each other? Oh, 20 years, maybe more. Now, I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to take the field against your team if that boy's in uniform. Why is that, Herb? His name is Jackie Robinson, by the way. Yeah, Branch, I understand he's got a name, but we're just not ready for that sort of thing here in Philadelphia. Well, what you do with your team is your decision, Herb. But my team's going to be in Philadelphia with Robinson, and if we have to claim the game as a forfeit, so be it. That's nine to zero. In case you forgot. And I'd like to know what it is you think you're trying to prove. You think God likes baseball, Herb? What, what the hell is that supposed to mean? It means someday you're gonna meet God, and when he inquires as why you didn't take the field against Robinson in Philadelphia, and you answer that it's because he was a Negro, it may not be a sufficient reply. It's powerful. How many of you are comfortable enough being vulnerable to do that? How many of you understand your true identity? So that's what we're called to with my first challenge. Now, naturally, as we sort of surrender ourselves to Christ, as we're vulnerable to Christ, as we lose our identity to Christ, then we are able to develop some substance. Interestingly enough, in Dr. King, we have an example of an individual who struggled with this process. We see him as a human being. What we actually see is a teenager who suffered from depression. He even actually attempted to commit suicide twice, jumping out of the second story of his parents' home. We see an individual who was grappling with the death of his grandmother. He was blaming his, himself for his grandmother's death. And he was a very intellectual man. He even at one point sort of questioned the resurrection of Christ. We see a human being. Now fast forward a few years to Morehouse College, where we see Dr. King sort of developing as a, as a young adult. And he's now dealing with racism as an adult outside of his parents' house for the first time. And he's sort of questioning why racism exists. And he's starting to sort of develop in his mind sort of an idea to sort of eradicate racism, that this is ridiculous. And he's surrounded by his classmates, his peers, uh, Professor Benjamin Mays. And he begins to realize that the only way to solve the racism problem is Christ. Complete transformation of mind. He begins to surrender himself to Christ. And as he surrenders himself to Christ, he begins to study. He begins to study his word. He begins to fill himself with substance. He begins to read the works of Thoreau and Niebuhr and Rauschenbusch and Gandhi. He begins to develop a philosophy of nonviolent protest. You know, he dug deep roots. These were his formative years. Here at Hope College, 
you have an awesome opportunity to dig some deep roots and to develop some substance. You know, my fondest memory, and I think I, I told you this in chapel, was sitting right over there, coming to chapel on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and just surrendering myself to God and, and worshiping God and living out his call, being constantly challenged by my group of friends, the pictures that I showed you earlier. And through that process, through that process of as Iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. Through the process of submitting myself to God, to diving into the word, I developed some deep roots in the soil of hope. How often are you coming to chapel? How often are you engaging with the Keppel House staff? Have any of you enrolled in the Peace and Justice Minor? How often are you digging into your word? What substance do you have? If your cup is not filled, it cannot pour over into sort of social justice. It cannot pour over into racial harmony. I will tell you, after you graduate from Hope College, it gets harder. This is the only time you will have in your life where you're going to be living with people who think differently than you, who look differently than you, who come from different backgrounds and different homes. This is literally the only time in your life in which everything is aligned for you to develop substance and dig deep roots. Because without it, you cannot be the Branch Rickies of the world. Without it, you cannot be the Martin Luther King Juniors of the world. Without it you will just fall to the wayside. Our job is to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bears fruit in its season and whose leaves do not wither. If you do not have substance, if you do not dig deep roots, when somebody says a racist remark, you're not going to stand up for that. When things get tough, you're just going to Falls by the wayside. So that's, that's my next challenge. And I know it's difficult. I know you, it's, it's, not, it's not the typical Martin Luther King Jr. talk, but this is getting at the heart of things. This is getting to the heart of the matter. We can change laws. We can recruit more minority students. We can do all this stuff. But unless you change your heart, unless you align yourself with Christ, nothing will change. We are 50 years. We're half a century past segregation, and we're still dealing with racism. We're still repeating the same cycles. It's not about laws. It's about substance. It's about your heart. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. This is just repeating the same thing over and over again. Lose yourself in Christ and you will find a new life. You'll be able to engage in community. Number three, light up the tower of hope. No man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel basket. You hear this every Sunday at chapel. Is that correct? Right? No man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel basket, but puts it on his stand so that all who enter the house can see its light. As you overflow, naturally, your light will shine. You can't help it. So when I say light up the Tower of Hope, I'm not talking about sort of one thing that you do to bring about change. But I challenge you to really have that change of heart so that you can go to the Office of Multicultural Education and engage. As a show of hands, how many, just the students, because I know we don't all have students here, how many of you went to the last BSU meeting? Wow. That is a great example of how you can engage. How many of you went to the latest Latin Students Association meeting? How 
How many of you eat with the Phelps scholars? A few more hands. Are you all Phelps scholars? <laughs> Something that really disturbed me when I was actually a student here, and I was, I was talking to my wife about this, and I, I think I was talking to Ms. Green earlier, was that there was a sort of campaign to raise awareness about homelessness. And students set up these tents in the Pine Grove. And the job was you take shifts overnight in a tent to raise awareness for homelessness. I will tell you that a homeless person does not take a shift. A homeless person probably does not have a nice tent with iPads and all of the latest technology and access to Phelps Dining Hall like two, two minutes away. Yet somehow my classmates thought that by doing that, they were making a difference in society. Wow, yes, I did something great. Not a single homeless person is better off because it camped out in the Pine Grove. So when I challenge you to attend a BSU meeting, when I challenge you to engage with the Phelps Scholars, when I challenge you to broaden your worldview while you're here at Hope and to build a community, I'm not asking you to check off some task on a to-do list. I'm asking you to have a change of heart. I'm asking that your actions be a part of who you are. When you have a change of heart and when your actions are a part of who you are, we naturally engage in community. We naturally function as human beings where our differences do not matter. Dr. King left us with a legacy that talks about this very thing. You know, he was really prophetic, if you, if you really think about it. You know, he was arrested over 30 times. And one notable time, I think many of you had the opportunity to read the letter from the Birmingham jail. And I will tell you, I'm not going to read the whole letter for you. But in that letter, it talks about our actions. It talks about a change of heart. This is, it's gone through exactly what we talked about today. Unfortunately, I don't think in society we have recognized that aspect of Dr. King's life. Too often we focus on the I have a dream speech instead of getting down to the nitty details of how we can actually change and impact our society. We talked this morning in chapel about how faith without substance, or faith without works is dead. It's the same thing. We have faith in the I have a dream speech, but we don't put the work in to actually make the dream a reality. So I'm going to leave you with just an excerpt from his time in the Birmingham jail. And as I read this for you, I want you to picture yourself receiving this letter. I just want, to, I want you to picture yourself just opening this letter, going to your mailbox and, and pulling this out and reading this. And I, and I want you to also imagine how comfortable Dr. King was with vulnerability, how difficult it also must have been for him to write this. I want you to really sort of process these words See how they are present in your life and whether or not you can take on the challenge to light up the Tower of Hope. And as I said before, it's a difficult task. It's not easy. If it, if it was easy, we'd already be doing it. These are his words. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. What I'm talking about is justice, justice, just us. In this place together, 
rooted in the soil of hope, engaging in community, and changing the world for the better. This week, you have an awesome opportunity to begin to take on that challenge. Today is Monday, and on Saturday is our day of service. This week, try to bang out steps one, which is to identify who you are, and two, figure out maybe how you can start to develop some substance. Get a game plan together. Write it out. You know, I, we, we have our New Year's resolutions. We have our three New Year's resolutions, right? Get another piece of paper and write them and leave space in between. Something I was told, something I, I learned from, from my family is that, you know, you can't ag- achieve a goal without hashing out the ways in which you're going to do it. So under each of my themes, identify who you are, put a checkbox and figure out how you're going to make that happen. Develop some substance. Put check boxes. Figure out how you're going to make it happen. And then come out on Saturday and serve with a changed heart. And let that be a launching pad for a lifetime of service and engaging in community. Thank you very much for your time. I've very much enjoyed being here and engaging with you all today. I really appreciate the opportunity to stand here for this Martin Luther King Jr. keynote address. Thank you.